Hi everybody, my name is Mr Barlow and welcome to episode 3 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 1, Area of Study 1, and I'll be talking about enzymes, cellular respiration, photosynthesis, and organic molecules. So continuing on from the discussion about cells in episode 2, uh, the first thing I want to talk about in this episode is the role of enzymes in cells. So there are heaps of chemical reactions that go on in our body, or, you know, in the cells in our body all the time. Now sometimes these reactions don't go quite fast enough for our bodies to function properly, and this is where enzymes step in. So enzymes are proteins and they're biological catalysts. And that means they speed up the rate at which chemical reactions take place. So sometimes they can speed up a reaction millions of times. They can make a chemical reaction go millions of times faster. And enzymes have some really important properties. So importantly, they're not changed and they're not used up in a reaction. All they do is help a reaction take place. So they can go and help, one enzyme can go and help one reaction take place. And then when that reaction's done, they can go and help another reaction or the same reaction because they're very specific but the same reaction take place and they can do that over and over and over again so one enzyme can help you know a chemical reaction take place over and over and over again the same specific reaction so basically they make reactions happen far faster in the body so you know, as I said they're specific so they're sp specific to one reaction so one type of enzyme can't help photosynthesis take place and then go and help cellular respiration take place one enzyme is very specific to one chemical reaction now enzymes are also uh, affected by temperature so enzymes work really really well well for example human enzymes work really well at temperatures of around about 37 degrees but if you cool them down below 37 degrees they don't work as well as they did before and if you heat them up, they don't work as well as they did before. But if you heat them up too much, you can kind of break them and you actually denature them. So, I mean, any protein, if you heat it up too much, you denature it. So if you heat up an enzyme too much, you denature the protein and, and the, the way the protein um, folds together. So the shape of it breaks and therefore the function of the enzyme doesn't work anymore. Now the reason that the shape of an enzyme or the shape of a protein is really important is because enzymes have what's called an active site. And the active site is very specific to a particular substrate or you know the, the molecule in a chemical reaction that it's going to change. So a substrate binds to the active site of an enzyme, the enzyme then acts on it and it releases a product and that's basically the chemical reaction. Now when the uh, substrate is bound to the active site of the enzyme, it's called an enzyme substrate complex. So, but that active site is really important. If the temperature increases and the shape of the active site changes, or the pH gets too high or too low and the shape of the active site changes, then the enzyme won't be able to function anymore. So the substrate won't be able to bind to the active site, the enzyme won't be able to help change that substrate into the products, and you know, the chemical reaction won't be able to take place. And that's no good. Now the next thing I want to talk about is energy. So how do cells get energy? Well energy for cells is stored in chemical bonds. So if you're a cell and you need a bit of energy, all, what you do is you break down a molecule called adenosine triphosphate or ATP and you break it down into adenosine diphosphate or ADP and then you get energy. So there was energy stored in the bonds you break ATP to ADP and then you get energy. And that's fantastic, but how does a cell get more ATP? And that's where a really important chemical reaction called cellular respiration comes into play. So basically, cells recycle ADP back into ATP via cellular respiration. And there's actually two types of cellular respiration. There's aerobic cellular respiration and there's anaerobic cellular respiration. So the first one I want to talk about is aerobic cellular respiration. And aerobic cellular respiration basically means that there's oxygen present. So aerobic cellular respiration, the chemical reaction is glucose plus oxygen goes to, in the presence of enzymes, carbon dioxide plus water plus energy 
and that energy is in the form of ATP and there's 36 to 38 molecules of ATP. So aerobic respiration makes quite a few molecules of ATP, 36 to 38, but you've got to have oxygen present. Now in reality, uh, glucose plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide plus water is an over, or it's a simplification of aerobic respiration. Uh, it can, it's really a series of chemical reactions which can be divided into three stages, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport. Um, glycolysis is the splitting of one glucose molecule, um, which produces pyruvate. That then goes into the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Um, and all those things all added together produce the ATP. So it's actually a series of quite complicated chemical reactions. So aerobic cellular respiration requires oxygen, uh, but if you don't have any oxygen around, uh, cells still need energy, so a process called anaerobic cellular respiration takes place. So anaerobic respiration actually starts the exact same way as aerobic respiration, so it starts with glycolysis. So that is, it breaks down glucose into two pyruvate molecules, and that produces two molecules of ATP. So then aerobic respiration has all those other things, you know, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain, which produce far more molecules of ATP. But in anaerobic respiration, after glycolysis, no more ATP is produced. So anaerobic respiration produces two molecules of ATP. After that, the pyruvate uh, basically ferments um, and no more energy is produced. So the chemical reaction for anaerobic respiration is actually different uh, in animals and plants. In animals, uh, the chemical reaction is simplified to glucose, uh, goes to lactic acid plus energy, ATP. Uh, in plants, the chemical reaction is glucose, goes to ethanol plus carbon dioxide plus ATP. So in both anaerobic and aerobic respiration, glycolysis takes place in the cytosol of the cell. But then in aerobic respiration, the rest of the series of chemical reactions occur in the mitochondria. So that's why when people talk about the mitochondria, they say that it's the powerhouse of the cell, because that's where uh, energy is produced. So we've talked about how cells get their energy by breaking down ATP, and we've talked about how cells um, get more ATP by breaking down glucose. But what do cells do if they don't have any more glucose? Well, that's in fact where a really, another really important chemical reaction comes in, and it's called photosynthesis. So basically, photosynthesis converts light energy from the sun into chemical energy, which can be used by cells. So photosynthesis, it occurs in plants, and it occurs in an organelle in plants called a chloroplast. Chloroplasts contain a, a pigment in them, which is called chlorophyll. That's green, and that absorbs or traps sunlight. So what happens in plants, in chloroplasts is, or to simplify it, carbon dioxide plus water plus light energy from the sun is converted into glucose plus oxygen and water. Now again, that's actually a simplification. So there's actually a series of chemical reactions that happen in photosynthesis. There's a light dependent stage and there's a light independent stage, um, but that can all be summarized into that, you know, key reaction, carbon dioxide, plus water in the presence of light and chlorophyll goes to glucose plus oxygen plus water. Now, did you pick that up? It's, it's converted into glucose. So that's that really important molecule that both plants and animals use for cellular respiration. So photosynthesis is really important because it converts light energy into chemical energy in the form of glucose that plants and then animals that eat the plants use or their cells use to create all of the energy um, to do all the jobs that they need to do. Now you might have noticed that the chemical reaction for cellular respiration is very similar for the chemical reaction for photosynthesis. Often in fact if you, if you can remember one of them you can remember the other. They're close but they're not. They're close to being the reverse of one another. So I'll say them both again quickly. So the chemical reaction for cellular respiration is glucose plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide plus water. And the chemical reaction for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water goes to glucose plus oxygen. And it also produces a little bit of water too. So they're close to being the reverse of one another. 
In fact, sometimes photosynthesis is summarized as the reverse of cellular respiration, which is carbon dioxide plus water goes to glucose plus oxygen. Uh, but so there you go. Plants are in fact really important for animals to get energy because if they didn't convert the light energy from the sun into chemical energy, we wouldn't be able to eat them and then use that chemical energy to power our bodies. So we know that aerobic cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria and photosynthesis happens in chloroplasts. So the last thing I'd like to talk about in this episode is some of the other functions that some of the other organelles have which enables a cell to survive. So the organelle that I would say is the most important uh, for a cell is the cell's nucleus. So the cell's nucleus contains that cell's DNA and the DNA has encoded on it all of the instructions which enable that cell to do its job, whatever the, whatever the function of that particular um, cell is. But the question is, how do the instructions get out of the nucleus into the cell? And then, you know, if there's instructions or things which need to happen out of the cell, how do they get out of the cell? Well, basically, the process starts when the instructions on the DNA are transcribed onto a new molecule called messenger RNA, and the RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So that messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus through little pores in the nuclear membrane. So when that messenger RNA has left the nucleus, it then goes to another organelle called a ribosome. And this is where the RNA, or the message on the RNA, is translated into a protein. So ribosomes produce um, or synthesize proteins. So that, that protein can then you know, go around the cell and do its job, or it can be transported outside of the cell um, to be carried around the bloodstream, for example, to do whatever its job is. Now, sometimes ribosomes are by themselves in, in the cell, but often they're associated with another organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. So if the endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, it's called rough endoplasmic reticulum. If it doesn't have ribosomes on it, it's called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So rough endoplasmic reticulum, because it's got ribosomes on it, is involved in the uh, synthesis and transport of proteins. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in the synthesis and transport of molecules other than proteins. So talking about proteins, sometimes ribosomes don't completely make a protein that's, you know, like finished. So what happens then is from the ribosome, the you know, half finished protein goes to another organelle called a Golgi apparatus. And a Golgi apparatus modifies the protein a bit and it also creates little transport vesicles. Um, so they're little, little membrane bound organelles within the cell and they can carry materials like proteins outside of the cell in a process called exocytosis. So if proteins need to leave the cell, let's say they're a hormone, they need, they'll leave in a vesicle um, which buds off the Golgi, appara Golgi um, apparatus in a process called exocytosis. Uh, now another organelle is called a lysosome. So this does a digestive job in the cell. So it breaks down waste and any unwanted cellular material. Uh, now, the last organelle I'll talk about uh, is a vacuole, which, um, I mean, they're, they're often really big in plant cells. They're found in plant and animal cells, um, but in plant cells, they're, they're huge. They contain sap and they can provide structural support for the plant cell. Now, importantly, not all cells have got the same number of all the organelles. So here's a couple of examples to illustrate that point. Muscle cells in human cells might have heaps of mitochondria in it because muscles need to um, make lots of energy. So muscle cells need to um, produce lots of energy so they have lots of mitochondria in them. Another example might be in a plant, a leaf cell. The cells of a, of a leaf would have lots of chloroplasts in it because that's where photosynthesis takes place. Um, whereas the cells of the root of a plant would have no chloroplasts in it because it doesn't see any sunlight. So th there's no point having chloroplasts in a root cell. So you can see by looking at a cell um, what their specific function is. And uh, a last example is that um, a cell involved whose main job it is to um, 
produce proteins that might have lots of ribosomes, lots of endoplasmic reticulum, and uh, if its job is to make proteins and excrete them out of the cell, have heaps of uh, Golgi apparatus. So, you know, a cell whose job it is to synthesize proteins is going to look very different from a cell whose job it is um, to be a muscle, and they're both going to look very different from a cell whose job it is to perform photosynthesis. And that brings episode three of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thanks for listening. Listening.